Hi guys, my name is Sean. I'm a houseplant enthusiast from Jakarta, Indonesia. I like to nerd out to the science behind how we can keep our houseplants happy and to multiply them in our homes. So if you're into contents like this, please do subscribe to my channel and send me likes. Uh, in today's video, we're going to talk all about fungus gnats. Uh, that is actually a very popular topic if you troll around on the Facebook uh, plant groups. The most commonly asked question is how do I get rid of fungus gnats? And I actually have a copy and paste answer for that which I try to paste to, on a lot of, of these problems in the comment section and I'm very happy to hear that a lot of them have actually wrote back to me to let me know that their method is successful. So uh, I'm going to spot it to you first of all the, the method that works for me and I'll explain to you the full science uh, behind it and if you want to skip the entire video I won't blame you uh, but the, the key to getting rid of fungus nest is actually bottom watering and bottom watering correctly so I, if you want to know the details do watch till the end of the video but I will walk with you through you know sort of the, the long-winded explanations uh, of what they are what they do and how we can get rid of them so before we get started I'm going to show you a disturbing clip uh, of a fungus gnat so as you can see I have a lot of plants in my bedroom and I do get infestations here and then now and then uh, and I was actually sleeping in my bed, obviously, where else would I be sleeping? Uh, and what happens is that fungus gnats love flying into my ear. They just fly around, maybe in there. I don't know if they're in my ear or not, but they're just so loud. So one day, uh, instead of jumping out of bed, I decided to quietly grab my phone, uh, cross the pillow, and put the record button and have the record button on and I put the phone next to my ears where the fungus nets are and just recorded them. So what you're about to hear is the buzzing sound of them flying about in my ear. So yeah. All right, so I hope you're not having a full meal while you're listening to that. It's pretty gross. So uh, fungus gnats are actually not harmful for humans and pets and even for, I would say, for plants unless you have a crazy infestation. They generally don't do any harm. They feed on the fungus materials uh, in the soil and around the roots. Um, but they do fly into our nose and into our ears. Um, uh, thankfully, I haven't had any incidents in the nose, or maybe I do, I just haven't felt it. But uh, there's a hint as to why they do that. Why would they go inside your nose and your ears? Is it because you have free Wi-Fi in there? Hmm, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, oh, that was a bad joke. Uh, so they're flying into um, your pots and your nose and your ears because they can, they're very sensitive to humidity, so they can and want to be in a humid environment where they know there's going to be fungus around, which is their food. And that's also where they breed and where they lay eggs and their larvas are going to survive and thrive in those conditions. So that's what draws them to a certain area. So I'm, I cannot insert a photo of a fungus gnat, even though I've had a lot of experience seeing them in person, uh, because you just can't take somebody else's photo and post it in your video. And I haven't seen them around in a while, but um, I do have a close up picture of them on a, on a pinguicula, they're just getting eaten by that plant. So yeah, one of the, the, the ways you can get rid of fungus nets is to get a pinguicula, which is a carnivorous plant that, uh, that really works well on the fungus nets. But I, I, I'll go through the, 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 the methods later on for you. Uh, so yeah, that is the clip for you. So how does fungus nets get to your plants? Well, they fly from pot to pot and they uh, breed, reproduce, and, and basically they multiply very quickly. Uh, they come in uh, to your house from you know, your groceries, uh, maybe there are like fruit flies flying around your groceries, you know, bananas or things like that, coming in from a garbage, could come in from other plants that you brought home and uh, potting media and so on. Um, so it's no use to say to, to do any blame games because I know some of you guys are like oh yeah I brought this plant from this seller and they have fungus fungus nets are very common and it's out of our control so I, I don't blame anyone for any fungus nets control and also I'm confident that my method really works on them to decimate them so uh, first we have to discuss uh, fungus nets um, and, and their uh, life cycle so fungus nets adults can live up to one to two weeks they can fly around mate feed and, and do all that stuff before they die 
uh, but their whole life cycle, which means the egg, larva, and adult stage, that takes about one month to complete. So when we're talking about a life cycle, we're talking about a complete one month cycle of um, the, the, the insect. Sorry, the pest. Sorry, I, I'm just, I'm learning again. There are many types of pests. There are insects, there's aphids. Apparently they're all different categories. I'm still learning about that. Um, but yeah, so as long as they can lay somewhere from 30 to 200 eggs, in one go and that's a lot so if you find a few fungus nests you should start worrying around a bit because if you leave it alone you're gonna end up with thousands within like a month or two months so it's quite, gonna be quite a party in your bedroom so the leading cause of fungus nets is actually overwatering or improper watering um, when you have a lot of overwater plants um, that's an ideal condition for the gnats to fly around. Um, actually, in our indoor spaces, plants don't need as much water as we think. Uh, if you live outdoors, sure, you can water your plants more often, you can keep the soil a little bit more moist because the evaporation rate is faster. That means that the condition for the fungus gnats is not as ideal outdoors. And also when you're outdoors, fungus gnats actually have a lot of natural predators that actually feed on them. They find them tasty and delicious. <laughs> so they don't really do that well uh, outdoors. Or they do, but the population is, is very controlled and it can get really out of hand in your living space, in your indoor space. And actually, if you look around your plants, you can actually find the culprit. You can see which ones are actually harboring the uh, fungus gnats. Uh, first of all, you can look for visual cues. They're usually flying around or they're scrambling on the top soil of the, the plant in question. And the, the another really common uh, way to find them is that when you're watering that particular plant, the gnats will fly out. Vroom, they will, they get, out of, get out of there <laughs> because they will drown in water, obviously. So the adult gnats will have to get out of there when you're watering. The larvas and the eggs, um, they do thrive in a humid and damp environment. So they're okay with that condition so yeah so uh, back to my uh, solution I've actually tried many many methods of getting rid of fungus nets I've also did a lot of research I will share those methods with you later but I'm gonna go straight to the one that really works and it costs no money it's free of charge you guys and that is bottom watering and the key is to bottom water correctly and also to do it infrequently a lot of plants uh, are gonna appreciate drying out between watering. So trust me when I say that you are probably overwatering your plants if you are having a fungus net infestation. So here's how the bottom, bottom watering works. Uh, nets actually live, uh, first of all, they're gonna be flying around adult nets and when they're ready to reproduce, they're gonna have to find a, a humid, damp uh, surface to dive into and lay eggs. If they cannot find that surface, they will die. They, they simply have no place to breed and make babies. So that's one way to prevent them to, to come into your plants is to have a dry topsoil. And I would say you need to keep at least 20 to 30 percent of the topsoil completely dry, not even like damp, like completely bone dry. And I'm going to show you how later. Um, and also another thing you need to know is that the larvas and the eggs of the fungus gnats actually live also within that um, top section of your soil they live maybe like maybe one centimeters under your soil down to like I don't know they don't live very deep down they, they have no business uh, living all the way down into uh, the soil oh and I forgot to mention that when you do have a crazy massive fungus net infestation they have they're feeding on the fungus on the roots right but when the fungus is gone they're so overpopulated they may end up eating your roots so, and that's like something that is contested. Like some experts are saying, yeah, they do that. They, they can harm your plants. And some people say you can't. And I'm just putting it out there for you guys. I don't know what I believe. I just know that they shouldn't be in our plants. Um, so whatever the truth is, we need to get the larvas, which are gonna be feeding on the fungus around the soil and the roots. We need to get them out of there. And one way to do that is just to keep their living conditions unlivable. So keeping that top 20 to 30% of the soil, top soil dry. So when you bottom water, actually, you have, um, you have to master it. It's not as easy as you think. So bottom watering is basically when you put a, a pot of plant into a, 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 I don't know, a container filled with water. And the trick is, hang on, you know what? I'm going to take you to the bathroom. I'm going to show you a few scenarios so you know what I'm talking about. Because bottom watering it really depends on the pot size, the pot type the media and the, the plant like there's a lot of factors in it and it just takes a little bit of uh, 
guessing and trying to get it right. But again, keep in mind, whatever method that you use for to bottom water, you need to have the final result is to have the top 20 to 30 percent of the soil dry. And I must be honest with you, in the beginning of my bottom watering lessons that I perform on all my plants, I do make a mistake. I leave it in for too long and the water is just um, being wicked up all the way to the top so the top becomes soggy. So it takes a while to master your plants and based on again your uh, the, the pot type and all that stuff uh, to learn how to bottom water correctly. Um, so yeah, let me take you to, to the sink. So I'm in my sink where I bottom water my plants and here I have a vessel that is um, a little bit filled with water and this is a very thirsty peperome incana. Look at that, it's just mushy. Uh, yeah, it should be a lot firmer than this. So when I watered him and I waited a few hours later, it will, it will be more firm for sure. So this needs a lot of watering. So it's in a terracotta pot and there's not a lot of soil media inside and it's maybe the general purpose uh, potting soil. So this will soak up the uh, water pretty easily. However, keep in mind when you use terracotta because it's porous, um, water will also escape and it will be soaked in by the terracotta as well. So actually terracotta will bottom water slower than plastic pots. So I'm gonna stick that in water. And next we have this Dishkidia watermelon. And this is in a very, very chunky, uh, barky uh, mix, a lot of perlite and pine bark. Uh, and it's in plastic and keep in mind when you're in plastic, I'm gonna put this in here, uh, and you put the, the plant in the water, it's gonna wick up the water uh, and because it's plastic, the water has nowhere else to go but up. So plastic will, will um, bottom water faster than terracotta. However, between these two, I would say they would bottom water around the same time only because this is in a very loose media. So imagine if you have big particles of uh, media where it's like bark and perlite, it's gonna take time for the water to sort of transfer from one uh, media, um, particle to another all the way up to the middle of the pot. So yeah, the particle size of the soil does affect how long you bottom water it. So it's different for every plant, it's different for every pot type. So yeah, when people ask like, oh, how, how do you bottom water, you know, how much do you time do you leave it for? The answer is, it depends. So uh, it takes a few times of miswatering. Like I make so much mistake with bottom watering. I even do today make mistake. Like I don't get it right 100% of the time. But uh, yeah, you just keep trying. And as you put more plants here, this is also very thirsty. Peperomia obtusifolia, <laughs> leaf falls easily. And yeah, so as I put all these plants on, the water level is gonna go up because the displacement of water, I guess. So I may actually have to add a little bit more water because um, as, as the plants drink up the water, water will be taken uh, in from the tray uh, up into the, the pot. Now, in my experience, when I leave a, a plants like this, I can leave them here for about, I would say three to five minutes, and then they will have enough water to reach probably, if you can see the water level here, uh, it's, it's around uh, this level. So imagine the water is actually hitting this this much soil in the, in the pot and as we leave it longer the water level will actually drop a little bit because the plant is drinking water but water is going to move up in the pot so you just have to practice a bit of imagination as to how high you want it to be and in our purposes we want the top 20 to 30 percent of the soil to dry so we want it to be a little bit more than halfway uh, wet and there's no way to measure that unfortunately you can get a moisture meter, which I do use, but I'm not gonna, sh maybe, you know what, I'm, go I'm gonna use it right now on maybe this plant. Yeah, as you can see here, I don't know if you can see here, you can't, hang on, let me bring this out. Of course, I'm gonna make a mess. If you stab this all the way in, into the pot, I don't know if it's focused, yeah. Now it's reading that it's wet. So what you can do is actually you can slowly um, insert your moisture meter and see the needle, it will jump, it will drop yeah, so now we're at the halfway point, I'm seeing that the needle has jumped to like a mid midpoint in, in the green. If you go further down, the needle is going to go to the, the blue zone. Of course, I don't recommend for you to stab your plants with moisture meter every time. You're going to disturb the root system a bit. So just a lot of the time, it's just intuition. Just kind of like hang, out, hang in there. Just make sure that you don't see any moisture. Uh, Topsoil really, like now I can feel it. It's like literally bone dry. I can just leave it there. Uh, and, and, and be comfortable with 
if I do overwater it, it's fine. Just like learn, just take it as, a, as an uh, experience um, and, and yeah, just let it dry out a bit. Um, another thing with the bottom watering, let's say you are in a hurry, you've got like 700 plants like I do. I can also keep adding the water until the water reaches like uh, to the, the, the near the top of the vessel or I can get even a, a taller vessel. And now that the water level is really high, um, let me see, hang on, let me focus one thing at a time. Uh, make sure I'm not over. Yeah, let's see, when, when this is really full and the level is really high, I know that the plant doesn't need much time to soak in that water as well. So I just give it like, uh, when I have the water at this level, I just wait for like 30 seconds or even like 15 seconds, uh, depending on the particle and again the pot and all that good stuff. So I know, like if I'm in a hurry, this is how I bottom water. I would just fill the vessel a bit higher, leave it for a short period of time, and then I'm done. And just take it out. So uh, again, you can also double check with a moisture meter to make sure that uh, water is getting into at least half of the, uh, the, of the plant. Um, here's a thing with uh, terracotta and plastic. The difference with plastic is that when, plas when you remove plastic out of the, the vessel, let's say I have, you know, let's say I have this much uh, water in there. What happens with plastic is that, unlike terracotta, which allows water to breathe and evaporate from the side of the pots, uh, plastic, you can't uh, do that. So the water is going to continue to uh, wake up because the, the, the water is really saturated down below. So even if you take the pot out, the water is going to continue to um, be moving upwards over the, the long period of time. There's just no, no other way for the water to leave the pot. This water is always going to move from an area of um, high concentration to low concentration. So that's why when you bottom water a plastic potted plant, for me, I do it fast. Like I don't leave it there for too long because I know that there's going to be enough moisture in there that will continue to wake up even after I've removed it from the um, bottom water vessel. So yeah, this is turning into a full-blown bottom watering how-to video. I'm sorry. I hope you learned a lot from this. But yeah, um, again, everybody have different methods and just use your feelings. Make sure that you get, you know, your watering correct. And you should have your fungus net probably gone in no time. Okay, so now you know how to bottom water correctly. And I'm going to share with you that in my experience, actually, fungus gnats disappear within two to three weeks from, you know, bottom watering everything correctly, especially the plant that is in uh, trouble that you see the fungus gnats around. And for those plants, you can actually let them dry out just a little bit longer than other plants. Just, uh, you don't need to use insecticide or anything like that. Um, but they will just disappear miraculously. I've done this in waves where like, I would get a fungus net infestation. I would start seeing a few things fly in my ear. They would wake me up in my sleep. Um, oh my God, they, they really do wake you up. That sound is like, imagine you're sleeping and just bzz, like something just flies in your ear. I actually have to cover my ear <laughs> with the blanket uh, when I sleep, when there's a net infestation, which is I would say once every three months or so. Uh, so yeah, the nets do come in waves. And when I notice there are some nets, the last time was about I think was when I filmed this actually was about uh, three or four weeks ago. Um, and then I just decided, okay, everything in my bedroom, everything in this area have to be bottom watered and correctly. So I just do that for the for next two to three weeks. And now they're gone. Like I don't have any more gnats around. So uh, just keep in mind, the gnats will always return, especially when you overwater or you give them the conditions. But if you stay consistent with just bottom watering, especially the problem plants, like certain plants you do notice uh, will have more nets, will be more prone to nets than others. So yeah, sometimes you may even have to put this plant, I would imagine like ferns may have a bit more fungus net problems because they need to stay moist. So just have them live outside or elsewhere, you know. Um, but yeah, they will be gone for sure. So if you have success, tried this method and you've succeeded, please do comment down below in this video because this will be a testimony, testimony, a testimonial for other people watching this video. So if you are uh, curious to see the results, please do read the comments down below because other people would, would write about whether they have success with bottom watering or not. All right, so we are going paperless today. I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna look at my phone. Normally I have a printed note next to me, but yeah.
it's late. It's I'm uh, filming at night, by the way, and I have a I have a glass of whiskey on me. So, <laughs> cheers. Um, yeah, I decided to also film. I forgot to mention. Oh my god, I I have so much going on in my mind that I I. I just jump around in points. I'm so sorry. Um, I decided to film at night because that's also when I do notice that the fungus gnats are a bit more active or when they're bothering me. Or maybe that's because I'm only here more often at, in, at nights. But yeah, I also f figured that it would be a pretty good ambience to, to let you guys experience what it's like at nighttime in my bedroom. Um, yeah, and a bit of spoiler alert, I do want to talk about, uh, there's a lot of requests on plants that will do well in air conditioned room in a Southeast Asian climate or in a equatorial in a in a climate that is like near the equator because we do have AC on every day throughout the year so it is important for us to know what plants can thrive here so that video is coming soon I do hear you guys um, yeah so just bear with me all right sorry I digress too much um, so what I've tried before um, I've tried neem oil soil drench and that's actually a really fantastic way so that's basically mixing you know, you know how you would mix your soapy water with neem oil and then you would just spray on the leaf of plants and it would, that would kill the, the pests that are on the leaves. Do that, except this time you want to drench the whole soil. You can even bottom water the pot in that solution or you can water it from the top because that really damages the, uh, the fungus gnats. But I did find that this method is smelly because neem oil is smelly and it's more troublesome. So just go with bottom watering. That's like a proven method. And uh, the next thing I did, that I do is I would sprinkle insecticide on it as well. Like uh, I use, I think, furadan. Yeah, it's a purple thing. So it, it's actually a, uh, an insecticide you sprinkle on the top soil. And you don't want to have that around if you have kids and pets, by the way. So you sprinkle on the top soil and just water it normally. And then as you water the plant, the insecticide will get down and down and dirty into the soil and kill everything inside. So that's one way. I've also tried um, the yellow sticky paper. First of all, yellow sticky paper is super expensive. I mean, here in Tokopita is like crazy expensive. Um, so I decided to do a hack and I saw this online. I can't remember who it was from. But it's just to take a yellow paper, um, like, a, like a day glow yellow paper, because they're drawn to that color. Uh, and just put a little bit of Vaseline on it. Uh, or glue and just kind of leave it there uh, because the insect will be drawn to the color and it'll land on it and it will get their feet stuck on the Vaseline or the glue and then they wouldn't be able to leave. But I noticed that my fungus gnats just aren't attracted to that color so I don't know why. Uh, or maybe if they did like they just glide right off like they just skate on the, on the Vaseline and <laughs> fly off. I don't know. I. I I did look around a little bit, but not, they, they didn't seem to be attracted to the color here in my region. Maybe fungus gnats are different in, <laughs> in different parts of the world. I'm not sure. Um, the next set I've tried is a vinegar trap where like I have a ve vessel, like a, like a cone. Um, I have some cone beakers here and I fill it with water, uh, uh, some uh, vine apple cider vinegar as well as some soap dish. I would just swirl it around and just mix it and wait for it. So the gnats are actually attracted, they're very attracted to this uh, scent because it reminds them of that rot and rot usually um, it means that there's fungus around. So they're really drawn to that and they would supposed to fly down there and the reason you have a narrow covering is that when they fly down there they, they won't be able to escape again. Um, that hasn't worked out for me, I don't know why. Uh, yeah maybe again my gnats are special. I don't know, they're different. Um, but that's one, um, another one that I've used is diatomaceous earth. And that is really fascinating. Actually, I love the science behind it. And I, I, I'm going to sh share with you. So diatomaceous earth is basically fossilized remains of tiny aquatic organisms called diatoms. Sorry, I just probably from Google. I'm just reading straight off my notes. I'm sorry. Um, so basically, they're, they're old fossilized plants, uh, remains of uh, animals and, and I don't know if you want to say corals, uh, coral, like, they live in the, they're from the ocean, they're from the, the sea. So they ground them to a powder. So uh, for us, it's harmless. In fact, they, you have food grade diatomaceous earth that they sprinkle in our flour or in our rice where it will keep the pests from attacking uh, those, uh, in, those ingredients. Um, but we can also ingest it safely. So for us, they look like white powders, but for animal, for small, tiny, tiny pests, they are actually like glass. It's like, imagine if you, like, you have a floor full of glass and you're forced to like 
roll your body through that floor. <laughs> so that's what the insects are like. And actually, I, I've used diatomaceous earth before. It's just, I use a brush, like a, a random brush, and just like tap, 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 tap on the top soil. And then um, it's just to have it evenly sprinkled on the top soil, because that's where the gnats actually need, the barrier that the gnats need to go into to get to, to the bottom of the, to the underside of the soil. So when they pass through that layer of diatomaceous earth, their whole body, they just get cut up, like, oh, like they get sliced. And I didn't notice, like, I, I looked at them at the time, and then they were just struggling. They were just like limping oh, from side to side. Some of them can't even fly anymore. They were just limping from side to side in the, in the diatomaceous earth. And it's, pretty cruel i would say i don't know but yeah it was a slow painful death for them um, however why i don't use it anymore is because the atomaceous earth need to be kept dry the minute it gets in touch with humidity or water any kind of water droplets it renders them completely useless so yeah and the atomaceous earth is not sexy at all it leaves like white powders all over your plants uh, in the beginning of my plant uh, journey I actually had, did a lot of Instagram photos of my plants and they had like this white powder on the top soil and it's just like not it's not, not doesn't look so good so I stopped using it it's just one it's troublesome and it's just it's just not not for me but they do work yeah, just so you know I've actually never tried mosquito bits before um, I heard that they do work really well but they're not available in my region um, and also beneficial insects, that's something that I haven't tried. Again, uh, I cannot find those in Indonesia, maybe because I'm not searching for the keywords correctly, but I've seen ladybugs around, so I know that the beneficial insects do, do exist. But they don't sell them here in the same way that they do in the Western world. So I think that's all I need to tell you about fungus gnats. Um, yeah, Again, I want to stress for you guys to try out bottom watering. It'll make your life better. Your plants will actually thrive uh, when you give when you dry them out between watering because you don't have issues of like plants overwatered or rotting or getting stressed out because of overwatering. So do give it a try. Um, in fact, I should do a, a video strictly on bottom watering because there are a lot of benefits in bottom watering. In fact, <laughs> I'm gonna walk you through some of them right now. So what happens that when you, you're bottom watering a plant, um, you're allowing moisture to be wicked up to the plant evenly. This means that if you're used to top watering a plant over a, a, over a period of time, the, the water is just going to find the fastest way through down to the bottom of the pot through the drainage hole. So you're going to have pockets of dry air, dry water, dry soil in the in the pot. And when you bottom watering it once in a while, uh, this means that you're allowing that um, soil to soak up all the moisture evenly and to re re distribute itself. This means that, uh, you know, you have a more healthy um, root system in there that is more evenly uh, watered. However, I hear that you do have to interchange between bottom watering and top watering because if you only bottom water your plants, some, but some people are saying that some of the salts, uh, as, because we do uh, fertilize our plants and our plants fertilizers actually mostly salt. Um, actually, they do remain in the soil and sometimes you have to top water it to just flush out the salt. So uh, I would say keep a balance, do both. Um, obviously, we can't bottom water all the time because um, they do take a bit more time and they make a bit more mess. But yeah, uh, just, you know, practice your whatever works for you, whatever you're comfortable with. Just remember that you should try to bottom water once in a while. It's good for the plant. It's good for your soul. It's good for your sanity. And I'm just blabbering on. Um, yeah, I'm gonna finish this video. I'm sorry, I, I, this dragged on too long. I'm at Botanist on Instagram, so feel free to DM me there if you have any questions about plant care and propagations. Um, do like this video and subscribe to my channel, comment down below and all that good stuff so that YouTube will recommend my video to other plant lovers who hasn't found me yet. Um, and I just wish you all the best with your fungus net problems or, you know, if you have any friend, plant friends with that, that problem, do refer them to my video and, and try bottom watering. Seriously, try it. <laughs> I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching, guys.